Joining us right now, Robert Costa. He's a political reporter for the Washington Post. Hello, Robert. Good morning. Good morning. So is it all about the debt ceiling now? And are we going to have another showdown? And is there going to be another, oh, my gosh, the planes are going to fall from the sky if we don't do this? Uh, there's not going to be a showdown, not in the traditional sense that we've seen over the past few years. It's going to be a short week in Congress. Democrats in the House are going to their retreat in Maryland on Wednesday. So what you're going to see is Speaker John Boehner come back tonight, meet with his members tomorrow morning, try to hash out some kind of small ball deal on the debt ceiling, maybe a clean extension with a, a few demands attached. And uh, what what are those demands looking like? We heard bubbling last week that uh, maybe it's going to be uh, the potential so-called bailout for health insurance companies, uh, and we also heard that the Keystone Pipeline might be attached. Uh, those two specific options have been shelved. Uh, the two new options that have emerged, kind of the small options to attach to a debt ceiling hike, would be uh, military pensions increase. Uh, in the budget deal last year, you saw Paul Ryan and Patty Murray uh, lower some of the military pension increases uh, set for the future. Yes, we are well aware of that story. We covered it extensively here. So that, that potentially might uh, find its way uh, resolved here? Indeed. Indeed. But you, you know what, Larry? I think the way this is heading right now is actually toward a clean debt limit extension, because even if Boehner attaches his military pensions idea or if he does the doc fix, which is how med Medicare reimbursements uh, are calculated for doctors, if anything's attached like that, it still doesn't get 218 Republican votes. So I think at the end of the day, with a lot of conservatives in the House saying to Boehner, look, this is a charade anyway, it's political theater, Let's move on. I think Boehner may actually end up moving a clean bill to the floor, but we'll see early this week him try to do something, something small. And uh, we were talking about this late last week. Apparently now the idea of immigration reform is pretty much dead, not going anywhere anytime soon. What's going on behind the scenes on that? I, I think that story has been a little bit misinterpreted. I think really? comprehensive immigration reform is dead. I think you're not going to see the House conference with the Senate. But... It, it, it's very likely that House Republicans are going to do something on immigration this spring or summer, something not in terms of maybe a path to legalization, but you're going to see maybe a Republican version of the DREAM Act, a smaller versions of immigration reform, because they want to do something ahead of the elections. It's just not going to be a Chuck Schumer or Marco Rubio-style bill. Hmm. So you think a piecemeal approach by Republicans, a little piece of it, but not something that's comprehensive? Exactly. They, they, they want to do something for political reasons ahead of the midterms. They don't want to have the media uh, writing all these stories about Republicans doing nothing in immigration. But I think what Boehner was trying to do last week is throw cold water on the idea that it's going to be some grand plan. And, and, and there's no you know, concern that Chuck Schumer over at the Senate side would take anything coming out of the House and trigger a conference committee? He could. And that is a, that is a legitimate fear because the way, of course, the Congress works, that could happen. Uh, but I, the way the House is, is structured right now politically, uh, Boehner can't get the votes for anything that's beyond very, very uh, incremental move on immigration. Something so modest, Schumer, right? I think Schumer's looking long-term. He wants to see if in 2015 he can start moving towards something big again. A lot of talk in this town about that CBO hearing in which uh, the, the guy in charge of the CBO admitted uh, before uh, members of Congress that indeed uh, there is a byproduct of the uh, Affordable Care Act and that's that it disincentivizes people from working. Just a lot of conversation about that even on the Sunday talk shows this weekend. It was. It's a big topic. It's going to be a big topic for the rest of the year. Uh, how Republicans can go at the Affordable Care Act is going to be, I think, the key question for whether they win back the Senate. And they're going to have to find a way to bring this conversation on the CBO report beyond the beltway to make it really have some resonance across the country if they're going to really make that argument against the law. Uh, and right now I think it's still kind of a D.C. argument, but they – they're picking up some momentum, I think, on that issue. And what about the, 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 the Democratic argument that, well, no, what it really does is gives you more time to create and goof off and do stuff like that? Well, I mean, I think Democrats, as much as Republicans may have seized upon this CBO report, if you just, like, watch the Daily Show on Friday night or you listen to the White House's pushback, there's really almost a, a, a view on the Democratic side that this is not a problem and that they're not going to forcefully defend the Affordable Care Act every moment, but they're definitely not going to pull their punches every time. So Republicans, I think, are going to have to do something where they're not just going to uh, really wave the CBO report around and say, this is true, this is true, 
but they're going to have to really be prepared for a long political struggle against this law with the Democrats. Because the Democrats are not just but backing away right now in spite of the report. Robert Costa is our guest. Of course, he's the national political reporter for The Washington Post. And I wonder, seeing how so many Democrats are announcing their retirements, and, and a lot of them are longtime allies of minority leader Nancy Pelosi, it certainly looks as though the Republicans will retain their leadership, if not, in, in fact, increase their uh, margin of, of majority there in the House. Is it possible that Nancy Pelosi at this point will say, you know, it's time for Steny, to be, Steny Hoyer, of course, to be the uh, minority leader, and she's going to step down from leadership? It, it, I think it's very possible, uh, but it, there's, it, it's unlikely that Pelosi will even signal something like that until November of this year. Because to, and, and Boehner himself has always put something like retirement on the table as, as well, but they're going to wait till after the elections. But I think Pelosi, because uh, you're right, she's, she's facing another two years in the minority, uh, it may be time for a leadership change. But I'll tell you this, Nancy Pelosi, for her age uh, and, and for someone who's been a speaker and been a leader for a long time, she has a lot of energy. She reminds me a lot of John McCain. So, to, you know, retirement is something I'm always a little skeptical about when I talk about Nancy Pelosi. Yeah, so but generally as we look down the path, it, it, it seems like we've got a House that's, you know, controlled by Republicans. The Democrats control the Senate. We've got the midterm elections coming, and uh, the, a lot of people say well, it's really a battle to see if the Republican can take back the Senate or whether the Democrats can hold on to the Senate. It seems like in that environment, really, when you look big picture, step back a little bit, not a whole lot is likely to get accomplished. That's right. I think legislatively that's right. Uh, I, I think the biggest potential standoff was going to be over this debt ceiling, and that's really fizzled almost as a political drama. Uh, and so not much is going to be accomplished, but this is typical for election year. Uh, and I think the biggest drama we're going to see politically is the shutdown of last year. Uh, and I think there's no incentive right now for a lot of these lawmakers to do something big, especially on immigration. That would be the only thing. And we see right now that the House is just not going to have that kind of momentum, that kind of movement. He is Robert Costin. If you're a political junkie, you need to follow him on Twitter at Costa Reports because it is an unending stream of information, lots of inside stuff. And, you know, Robert, now that you're with the big media behemoth Washington Post, you don't have to be a scrappy reporter for National Review anymore. you got a lot of time on your hands. Tell me, are you catching the luge there out of Sochi? What's your favorite Winter <laughs> Olympic sport? Uh, I, I still, I'm still hustling, Larry. I'm still hustling. Check out the front page of the Post today. But, uh, oh, you know, I, pardon me, Mr. Front Page Costa. <laughs> now, with my buddy Paul Kane, we did a little preview of the debt limit. So, uh, on Sochi, I'm, I'm just not like a Winter Olympics guy. The only winter sport I like is uh, Capitals hockey. I live next to the Verizon Center. So, uh, but I'm the luge, all this stuff. Look, I, I'm rooting for Team USA. I'll check the, the sports page in the morning, but I'm not watching it with much interest. All right. I'm, well, I'm surprised you're not a, a rabid curling fan. Curling, yeah. You seem like a. <laughs> hold on a minute now. I didn't know you were a Caps fan, as am I. But what are you going to do if it comes down between U.S. and Russia and Ovi's on the other side? Is that going to be a cognitive dissonance for you? It is. I mean, look. He, he's he's my favorite player. I think he's the he's the heart and soul of the team here in D.C. Uh, but I'm a USA guy. So. All right, no, yeah, we don't want to paint you as Robert Putin Costa over there. <laughs> All right, Robert Costa, thanks for joining us. Always good to have you.